Again, good morning. If I've not had the opportunity to meet you yet, my name is Chris, and I have the great honor and privilege of serving as the pastor uh, here at our church. And it's an honor to be with you this morning. As you've come in, I want to start our time by asking a question. You ready? Easy question. I want you to think about your home. Maybe the home you grew up in as a child or the home that you are leading right now. And I want you to think about, did you have in your home any house rules? Things that were put into place to protect you, sometimes even from yourself. Were there house rules? Did you grow up uh, with the rule that you will not run with scissors in the house? Because that may end poorly. Did you uh, grow up with a house rule similar to what I grew up with in my house? My mom and dad, one of the rules was Sunday nights were family dinner. Sunday nights were family dinner. And it was always the same meal, and I looked forward to it all week long. My mom would make meatballs. She would put them in the pot. She would make fresh uh, Italian pasta sauce. It would simmer all day long. You'd come home and you could just smell it. Dad would make garlic bread. And every Sunday night, it was pasta, meatballs, sauce, and garlic bread. I didn't get this way begrudgingly, all right? But these were some of our house rules. These were things that we valued. Right now in my house, there's a few things that we value that we're trying to instill into our daughters. Things like prayer. We want them, like mom and dad, to be praying individuals. Above our dining room table is a little prayer that we have taught our girls to say uh, as a blessing over meals. It says, bless the food before us, the family between us. Uh, uh, beside us and the love between us. Bless the food before us, the family beside us, and the love between us. And it's one of our house rules. We pray this every time we sit down and we eat. One of the other things that we value is as much as possible, we try to put our girls to bed every night with, with a, a song and with a prayer, and every night we pray the Lord's Prayer over our daughters. So they know that. They could get up here. They might say it really fast, and you wouldn't understand. It'd be like, our father, like, it's okay. But they know every word. These are some of the things that we value. But again, what are some of the things that you value? In your house, in your family, what are your family rules? What are your family values? Well, let's do something a little bit different this morning. Let's turn to a neighbor, and let's just take a, a quick 30 seconds, and let's share one family value that you might have with a neighbor. Are you ready? I know it's a little intimidating, but it's okay. We can, we can do this. Let's turn to a neighbor just real quick and share one thing that we value as a family with our neighbor. Ready? Go. Good, 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 good. Everybody's got a value. Everybody's got something. Well, starting today, as you can see on the screens up behind me, we are launching into a brand new teaching series entitled House Rules. And over the next five weeks, we are going to be talking about the family values or the house rules that we as a church hope to establish and live out as a missional community. So there will be some terminology that we'll talk about and we'll teach and we'll unpack throughout this series. There will be some thoughts, there will be some activities, there will be some different things that we say and do in order that we as a church can begin to unpack and understand what our church family, house rules, or family I'll use those two terms interchangeably, what they really are. Amen? So we're going to dive in this morning, but in order to begin to explain what our family values are, we need to first explain what a church family is. 
See, on Sunday mornings, I'll get up and I'll say something like, good morning, church family. And it's exciting for me because as I look at our church, I look to those to our right and to our left, I believe that we have been brought together to be in relationship with one another as a church family. But for some of us, we might have a misconstrued understanding of what church is. Some of us grew up going to Sunday school and we were taught, you know, here's the church, here's the steeple, look inside and, and see all the people, right? And we were taught that the church was the place. But the church is not the place, the church is the people who gather at the place. So let me, let me explain this a little bit. In the Old Testament, there was a word, halal. It, Q-A-H-A-L is how it's transliterated. This word meant an assembly or a congregation, but in particular, it meant those who are called out, gathered or congregated together. So the Old Testament, the, the, the books of the Old Testament, books, Genesis through Malachi, were written in Hebrew with a little bit of Aramaic. When Jesus was walking the earth and he was living in Israel, while he knew and understand and spoke Hebrew and Aramaic, the New Testament was written in Greek. So when they were translating this word for congregation that was used to describe this called out group of individuals, they translated it into the Greek word ecclesia. And this word ecclesia or ecclesia uh, is translated from this word of assembly, but they attached the Hebrew word Yahweh to it, and it meant those who are called of the Lord. So when we begin to talk, talk about the ecclesia, the, the, the church, we're not just talking about this beautiful building. We're not just talking about these wooden pillars, this beautiful stained glass, the altar, the candles, the cross. This is not just, it is part, but it's not just what we're talking about. The church is the people. It's the people sitting beside you. It's the people who venture through life with you. It's the people that you get to know and love and meet and understand that these people are amazing people. But let's unpack this a little bit more. I want to share this quote. Above me, you'll see a quote from Thomas Oden. Thomas Oden uh, passed away recently, but he's considered one of the, the major Methodist theologians, somebody whose three volumes, Systematic Theology, again, probably a big fancy word to just mean the ordering of theology. His Systematic Theology is what I read at night. It helps put me to sleep. It's this big with words that I need a dictionary to understand. But Oden says this when defining the church. He says, the Christian church is the community through whom the Holy Spirit administers redemption and distributes gifts, the means in and by which God makes the reconciling work of the Son vitally present to humanity. So Odin's quote, let's, let's unpack this a little bit, is that the Christian church is a community. It's multiple people who were gathered together in the name of Jesus. It's a community. And it's through this community that the Holy Spirit shows up and he administers redemption. That means that something's broken. That means that we live in a fallen and a broken and a sin-filled world. And as a result, we need to be fixed in a way, in a relational fix between us and God because we've been severed from the relationship with God. So the Holy Spirit shows up, brings redemption, and distributes gifts. We spent the last several weeks looking at the gifts, the fruit of the Spirit of God. And through this, God reconciles us to Himself through the work of the Son. So let's build on this. There's a pastor in uh, Arizona right now uh, by the name of Mark Driscoll. Driscoll defines the church in this way. He says the local church... Because the church is both local and universal. It's all men and women and children in all places at all times. The church is not just located here in Port St. John. We are a local gathering of the church, but the church is local and it's universal. The local church is a community of regenerated believers 
who confess Jesus Christ as Lord. In obedience to Scripture, they organize under qualified leadership, gather regularly for preaching and worship, observe the biblical sacraments of baptism and communion, are unified by the Spirit, are discipled in holiness, and are scattered to fulfill the great commandments, to love your neighbor as yourself, right? The great commandment, love God, love others, and the great commission to disciple, to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, found in Matthew 28. So they are scattered to fulfill the great commandment and the great commission as missionaries to the world of God's glory and their joy. So we need to begin with an understanding of the church. We need to understand that the church is both local and universal. It's made up of little disciples and older disciples. The church is meeting in houses. It's meeting in warehouses. It's meeting in church buildings. The church is the people who gather, and it's the people who gather at the place. We have to have a big vision of the church because we need to understand what the church is in order to understand what we as a church value. So in the Bible, in the book of Acts, Acts begins to explain the formation of the early church. In Acts chapter 1, Jesus is having a conversation with his disciples. He's telling them, hey, wait until the Holy Spirit shows up. When the Holy Spirit shows up, You will then be filled with power. You will then go to Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and the ends of the earth. He gives them a game plan. And as they begin to lay out the early church, Peter gets up, he preaches a message, and they add thousands of people to the family that day. And as they begin to summarize, Luke, who wrote the Gospel of Luke, also writes Acts, as Luke begins to summarize what the church is, we find this beautiful summation in Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 20, or 42. So let me read this to us this morning. It says, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to the prayers. And all came upon every soul. Did you hear that? When they got together for church, they were filled with awe and wonder. I hope as a church family that you and I, that we would be filled with awe and wonder when we gather for worship. Awe came over every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together, and they had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and their belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, they were attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, and they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all of the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. This is going to be our key verse for this series. This is what we're going to come back to as we talk about the Acts 2 church. And there are many principles that we find here in Acts 2, and I want to point out a few of them, that these are defining characteristics of the church. First, there's repentance. Repentance is the ability to turn around and turn towards God. I think about it like the story of Jonah. Uh, We we looked at Jonah a few weeks back. We did kind of a a quick synopsis. But the thing about Jonah that I always found so amazing is that in Jonah's story, it demonstrates to us a real-life example of repentance. That you and I could run a million miles away from God. That we could try to flee from wherever we are, right here in Port St. John, and go to the opposite ends of the earth thinking, if I run far enough... If I hide well enough, God will ignore me. He won't see me. I'll be good. But trying to run from God is like a two-year-old trying to play hide-and-go-seek from their parents. They lay in the middle of the floor, and they're like, you can't see me. Where, where, I don't know where I am. And God's like, you're right there. 
But the thing is, is as we try to run far from God, God meets us where we're running to. So as we run a million miles away from God, repentance is turning around and realizing we are face to face with God. So as we understand that the church is a place that preaches repentance, that we can turn away from sin and we can turn to God, and God does not come to us in a condemning way, finger-pointed like, you know, you shouldn't have done that. He goes, I'm glad you're here. Come back. I love you. I forgive you. Doesn't give us freedom or, or an excuse to rebel and to sin as much as we want. But there's grace enough when we fall short. So the church offers repentance. The church also offers baptism. And we'll talk more about baptism in the future, but the easiest way that I want us to begin to understand baptism is that it's an outward and visible sign of an inward action. It's like my wedding ring. I use this as an example when I talk with parents about baptism. I said, you know, if I take this ring off, am I still married to my wife? Yes. Well, what does this symbolize? It's an outward symbol of an inward action. And I wear this as a mark, as a defining mark of something that is transforming my life, and that's what baptism is. The church is where baptism takes place. I can't grab my daughter, go home, and dunk her in the bathtub and be like, it's a baptism. It has to be done in community with one another because we hold each other accountable. The church also offers forgiveness. This is a tough one because one of the biggest complaints about the church today is that it's filled with judgmental, judgy hypocrites. I hate to say it, there's a world out there who doesn't know Jesus that when they look at you and they talk about you and they think about you and they don't even know you, they're prejudiced in their own assumptions, but they assume that you're a judgmental hypocrite. Because very often we're, we're slow to offer grace and forgiveness, and yet we, offer, we, we, we worship a God who offers an abundance of grace and forgiveness. The church should be a place that is marked by the forgiveness it gives. Does that become a doormat? No. And we can unpack forgiveness more later. The church is the place where the Holy Spirit is present. God has given Himself to the people, and the Spirit allows us to cooperate with God. Salvation is preached through the church. Salvation from sin, sins that lead to condemnation. For the wages of sin is death, the Apostle Paul says. But the good gift of God, hear me, the good gift of God is salvation in Jesus Christ. The church preaches salvation. The church teaches. That's what we're doing this morning. It takes the Scriptures and unpacks it and it teaches it in a way that hopefully allows for each of us to resonate with it and learn from it. The church is about relationship. John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, says that it's impossible for Christianity to be a solitary religion. It just can't happen. You can't show up, sit in the back, completely try to blend into the pew, ignore everybody, leave, go home, and be like, I'm good. Christianity is about relationship. Church is about relationship. It's about the breaking of bread. It's about the prayers, our ongoing conversations with God. It's about ongoing miracles. Miracles are taking place even today. God's Holy Spirit still shows up and shows off. It's about witness, us sharing our faith with others, and it's about worship. And this morning, what I want us to begin to look at as a church family, that our first value as a church family is that we are those who strive to grow stronger through worship. You see this? We are a church that strives to grow stronger through worship. So in our lobby we are going to hang up our five values. Every week, we've got one of these made. I'll bring it up. I'll show it off. I'll read it to us so that we can see it, and we'll hang it up in the lobby. After the five weeks, we'll have our mission statement up there, our five family values 
that we as a church believe in, that we as a church want to live into, that we as a church want to have define us as a church family. So this morning, our first value, as we look at what the church is, our first value, and some of these that I just read off, we're going to kind of pack them together, but our first value is worship. So my, my first point this morning is this. What is worship? Is worship music? Yes. But is it music alone? Is worship preaching? Yes. But is it preaching alone? The word worship is an old English word that means to give worth to someone or something. Jesus in the Gospel of Luke chapter 4, 8 says these words. He says, you shall worship the Lord your God and you shall you, you shall worship the Lord your God and you shall and only shall you serve and only him shall, wow that why is that so complicated <laughs> and only him shall you serve this is what happens when I read from a what's called a wooden translation it's word for word it's sometimes not the easiest to read Jesus goes on in the gospel of John chapter 4 verse 24 and he says God is spirit and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. So Jesus is telling us that we are to worship God and we're to do so in spirit and truth, but this is not helpful if we don't have a working definition of worship. If we don't have a working definition of worship, it's difficult to understand what worship is. So Harold Best, who's a uh, professor at Wheaton College, he teaches music. Uh, in that department, he's got a really good working definition of worship that I want to share with us this morning. He says, worship is the continuous outpouring of all that I am, all that I do, and all that I can ever become in light of a chosen or choosing God. So let me, let me say that again. Worship is a continuous outpouring. It means from the moment I wake up in the morning to the moment I go to bed at night, and every moment in between, I am constantly pouring out my life in worship to God. Brother Lawrence, who uh, was a famous monk, wrote that part of worship could be washing dishes. That if you are a dishwasher, you should wash dishes to the glory of God. That if you are a banker, you could bank to the glory of God. If you are a custodian, you could clean to the glory of God. If you are a carpenter, you could build to the glory of God. If you are a teacher, you could educate to the glory of God. That in all of your life, you could pour all of yourself out in worship to God. It's in all that we do, and it's all that we are becoming. Worship is the essence of of our being. It's not just a part. Some people will teach that you were born to worship. You were created to worship, or you were created for worship. Best point is that you were created, you were born worshiping. That it is part of who you are, part of your essence. As we think of what Scripture says in Hebrews chapter 13, it begins to unpack a six-fold pattern of worship. That when you show up on a Sunday, or when you live as an individual outside of these doors on your own, that is worship is both corporate, together, and private on our own, this is a six-fold plan that Scripture gives us. It says, through Him, then let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of lips that acknowledge His name. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have for such sacrifice is pleasing to God. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. You know the scary thing about being a pastor? Is that when, when I die and I stand before God, I have to give an account of every person who's been in ministry with me. For every sheep that the shepherd has to care for, they have to give an account for. That's why I spend a lot of time praying for you and myself, and for you and for myself, and for you and for myself. And we spend a lot of time in conversation because I know one day I'll have to give an account. James, the brother of Jesus, the half-brother of Jesus, says, like not many of you, 
should uh, undertake being a teacher because uh, don't you know that many of you will be judged more harshly? I mean, like, that's kind of scary. All right, back to Hebrews. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. So the sixfold pattern. Praise. Psalm 96.1 says, and I'm just going to read this first, first verse. I, have, I put down a couple, but I'm just going to read this first verse. It says, Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Praise. Church family, who or what do you praise most? Who or what do you praise most? Is it God? Is it Jesus? Is it your spouse? Is it your kids? Is it your career? Is it your car? Is it your finances? Is it your bank? Who or what do you praise the most? The second thing is proclamation. This is lips that confess His name. Church family, how often do you confess the name of Jesus? As an act of worship, do you talk about Jesus outside of these four or however many walls? When you leave at 11.08 today, we're going long, I'm sorry. Somebody's like, oh my goodness, lunch? No, I'm just... Uh, when you leave these walls and you go out into the world, do you talk about Jesus? Do you confess His name? The third pattern is service, demonstrating the gospel. Do you serve others with gladness or do you prefer to be served? Do you serve out of a heart that loves God or do you serve out of a heart that loves attention? Praise, proclamation, service, participation. Sharing in the life with others. Do you participate in the life of the church? Do you show up? Do you contribute your time, your talent, your treasure? Do you participate in the life of the church? This is an act of worship. Do you sacrifice? Not only participate in the life, but do you actually sacrifice and give your time, your talent, your treasure to share God's love in a tangible way with other people. As we think about church, um, we're going to change some lingo. We, we, we're saying this throughout this message. And I want us to start thinking about membership a little bit differently. In the not-too-distant future, I want to have kind of a recommittal of our membership to the church, but I don't want us to, to talk about being members Members gives this idea of kind of a country club, right? Members have rights, but I want us to talk about ownership. I want us to be owners because owners have responsibilities. We have a responsibility that if we're an owner of the church, if we're a member of the church, then we've got to sacrifice and give our time, our talent, and our, submit, our, our uh, treasure to bring glory and honor and praise as an act of worship to God. Praise, proclamation, service, participation, sacrifice, and last, submission. Do we respect godly authority? Are we listening to the godly authority that has been placed over us, or are we rebelling against it? Every church has elders, deacons, missionaries, evangelists, people who serve God and are placed in positions of leadership. We have a leadership team here at the church of individuals who have helped step into areas to carry out the mission and the vision of this church and to this community. And if we're volunteering or if we're coming to church, are we those who are listening to godly authority or are we constantly pushing back? This was the pattern of worship in the early church. And it's the pattern of worship that I hope that we can continue here 2,000 years later in the church today. That we would be those who praise and proclaim and serve and participate and sacrifice and submit. Now church, what's the opposite? Here's my second point. What's the opposite of worship? Very simply, it's idolatry. The opposite of worship is idolatry. Worship is the biblically faithful understanding of God combined with a biblical, biblically faithful response to Him. Martin Luther points out that, therefore, I repeat that the chief explanation of this point is that to have a God is to have something in which our heart entirely trusts. To have a God 
And to worship God means that our whole heart, our whole trust, our whole life are wrapped up in God. But if we take something else, we take a good thing and we elevate it to a God thing, we make it an idol, and we say that we've placed our hope, our trust, our life, our identity in someone or something else. And what happens when that something else disappears? We have an identity crisis. Our life falls apart. That's why sometimes with some of the younger generation, I'll pick on myself, my, my generation and younger, when we build our life on our career and the career gets taken away, our whole life gets taken apart. When we build our relationship on our kids or our spouses and God forbid something happens, but if something happens, our whole life falls apart. If our identity and our trust and our hope are not in Jesus, then it's in the wrong place and we're worshiping an idol. So church, does our heart entirely trust in Jesus? Does our heart entirely trust in Jesus? So lastly, my third point is this. How do we worship God together? We must understand that the Holy Spirit gives Christians the desire to worship God with one another. We desire to see God as people. We desire to hear the work that God is doing in one another's lives. We desire to be a part of something bigger than ourselves. Coming to church should be worshiping with others and experiencing something that is bigger than ourselves as we share the story of what God is doing in our life and in our community. We want to celebrate all that God is doing in your life. We want to hear the testimony of the church. Church family, we must understand that worship is active. It's not passive. Scripture commands us to regularly gather with one another for worship in Hebrews 10, 24-25. It says, let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good work, not neglecting to meet together. Like seriously, don't neglect it. Show up. Be present. Participate. As this is the habit of some, some people were like, you know what? Church is not all that important. The average churchgoer today is once every three to five weeks. There's 52 weeks in a year. If you show up once a month, that's 12 times in a year. That's less than, like, I think it was like 2% of your year's time that you give to God. Hebrews commands us, do not neglect meeting with one another as some are in the habit of doing but encourage one another and all the more as the day is drawing near. Eventually, Christ will return. Eventually, there will be a day where He will draw us home. We will either pass away and perish before that happens or we will be present when that happens. But eventually, Jesus is coming back. And we can either live in light of that fact, worshiping God, joining in community, living our lives on display, or we could miss out. So what must we do, church? What must we do? As we wrap this up, as we land this plane, what must we do? First, we must remain Christ-centered. This means that we need to sing songs about Jesus, preach sermons about Jesus, participate in sacraments that are Jesus-centered. We must remain Christ-centered in our worship. Second, we must be unselfish. And this is going to be hard for some of us because there is a world around us that has committed themselves to the path that leads to hell. And if we're so wrapped up in ourselves and our own personal preferences that we've neglected to step out and to show off the grace of God, then we are doing a disservice. And we are not living as transformed individuals by the gospel of Jesus. We must be unselfish. This will mean at times putting our own personal preferences to the side in order that we might reach the next person for Jesus. This means sometimes stepping outside of our comfort zone in worship to maybe sing a song we're unfamiliar with because that song might speak volumes to someone else. Like this morning, I was, uh, can, I just, can I speak honestly? Another in the Fire is my daughter's favorite song. Standing here, hearing her sing praise to God, 
brings tears to my eyes while maybe for a moment makes somebody else feel uncomfortable. But if we're unselfish in our worship, then we realize that it's an opportunity for us to worship God and bring others into His presence. There's nothing better than that. Amen? Amen. Last. Oh, oops, oh, sorry. Almost last. Worship must be orderly. There's no scriptural mandate for how worship is supposed to uh, take part. There's nothing in this book that says you sing a song, you read a prayer, you read the scriptures, you take communion, you go home. There, there's no order, which means our liturgy is up to us and how we shape it. Some weeks we may sing songs up front. Some weeks I might just show up and preach a message and we'll have one song. It'll be weird. It'll be uncomfortable. But you know what? It will be orderly. It will be intentional. Every song that is sung is thought out. Every scripture that is read is thought out. Every sermon that is preached is thought out. It's orderly. And this is my last point. The church is to be missional. We're to be Christ-centered in our worship. We're to be unselfish in our worship. We're to be orderly in our worship. And we're to be missional in our worship. That means that we understand outside those doors it's the year 2021. It means that the culture that is outside those doors looks different than maybe what it looked like last year or two years ago. Or before COVID hit, it looked different. Or before 9-11, it looked different. Or before pick something, it looked different. But today, the world that we step out into is different which means to be a missionally worshiping community, we bring a different package with the same president side. It's the same gospel. It's the same Jesus. It's the same church. It's just got a different ribbon and some different paper. And that's okay. Because the culture is changing. But Jesus is still good for the culture. Amen? So as we go forward... May we be those who are Christ-centered in our worship, unselfish in our worship, orderly in our worship, and missional in our worship. Let's pray. Father, I think of, I think of what G.K. Beale says when he says that whatever people revere, they resemble, either for ruin or restoration. May we be those this morning who revere and resemble Jesus, that our worship may be Christ-centered, that it may be unselfish, but it's orderly, it's missional to reach the next person who is far from your love with the love and the hope that is found through the gospel of Jesus Christ. So help us to live out moving forward public, publicly in our worship and privately in our worship, because it's all for you. We love you. We praise you in Jesus' name. And the church said, Amen. Amen.